back on his life, uh, but really to celebrate uh, the things that he has done. Uh, the book that he was able to, to finish uh, before he passed away, uh, Run, uh, book one, uh, is is just out. And I think you're going to find that the, it tells quite a story. We're fortunate tonight to be joined by Andrew Iden. Andrew is the creator and the co-author with Congressman Lewis of the graphic novel, Run Book One, uh, but also the earlier uh, trilogy, the March trilogy, which chronicles his earlier life. Uh, March was the first comic book ever to win a national book award. Andrew served as a special assistant to Connecticut's lieutenant governor, and he was a district aide to uh, Representative, Lew uh, Representative John Larson, rather, before joining John Lewis's staff. And he joined it as a campaign communications director, digital director, policy advisor, until the, uh, the congressman's passing last year. And I think... I think you'll find, as we discuss it tonight, that he's really a, the moving force uh, behind this uh, this uh, series. Uh, we're fortunate as well to have Nate Powell. Nate was part of the original team that created both the March trilogy and Run Book One. He's an illustrator who who brought the March trilogy really to life, and I think you're it's going to be fascinating to to hear how that was done. He has been doing this sort of thing, gosh, all his life. Um, he started uh, self-publishing at age 14, graduated from the School of Visual Arts. Um, his 2008 graphic novel, Sm Swallow Me Whole, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize in the Young Adult Fiction category. Um, and there's an interesting story about he, how he got connected to Congressman Lewis and Andrew, and uh, we'll get to that this evening. El Fury is the other illustrator for the book. Um, and it's she came on, she is new for this this series. Um, she started working in visual storytelling back in high school, got her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at Sam Houston. And then after a stint of uh, working in the gaming industry and marketing, she started doing long form comics and uh, the a humor web comic and self-publishing. And this is her first graphic novel. Anthony Dixon is also joining us. Anthony is Congressman Lewis's nephew. For the past 30 some years, he's been a firefighter in, uh, in LA County. Um, and Anthony, I want to begin with you because you grew up in, in uh, California and you're almost, Congressman Lewis is almost what, 30, he was 30 years older than you. So what was it like having John Lewis as an uncle? And did you know growing up about his history, his influence? Did, did he talk about that when he and uh, Aunt Lily came to visit? You know, it, that's such a cool question because the world knows Congressman John Lewis and the world knows uh, the icon of John Lewis. As kids growing up, we, uh, my brother, my two brothers and I, we all, when Auntie Lily and Uncle John came to town, that was, that was, that was better than Christmas. And, and, and I think part of it was because they were, they were come they weren't from Los Angeles. They were, they were coming from Atlanta and we used, we used to get so excited. And when they would come into town and uh, they would come by the house and we would wait up all night long and, you know, as a kid at eight o'clock at night, that's all night long for a kid growing up. And then they'll come in and my aunt was just as elegant as she had to be. And we just wanted to hang on Uncle John. There's like a picture circling around where, you know, we're all kids and stuff. And I'm hanging on Uncle John's shoulder. And as a, as a kid growing up, none of that even mattered. He would tell us stories and and stuff like that, but it, it was kind of like 
oh, okay, but Auntie Lily and Uncle John are here. Auntie Lily and Uncle John are here. And as we got older, it didn't kind of click in until I think maybe I was in my 20s or 30s when I really started understanding it a lot. When, well, let me take it back a little bit more. Being a part of the fire department, I asked my uncle one day and I asked him, I said, um, I want to be involved politically because as, uh, as with, with the fire department, we have a very strong political voice in Sacramento and Washington. And he looked at me and he says, nephew, he says, the International Association always gives my campaign. Maybe you should get involved that way. And it wasn't that long after I had that conversation with him. I joined our, our political action committee and I was, I had been the chair, I had been the co-chair and I've worked on different districts. But as I got older, the, the smoke cleared up, but growing up as a kid, it was just Auntie Lily and Uncle John were coming to town. And then it was Auntie Lily, Uncle John and John Miles. We had, a, we have a cousin, it was, just, it was awesome. So yeah. Then Andrew, tell me about your relationship with with John Lewis, how that developed. Yeah, um, I started in his office answering his mail. Uh, I actually uh, first got to meet him as an adult, as a professional, when I interviewed for the job in his office. And I'll never forget, you know, I'd worked for a few politicians before then. And, and we did the interview and it was very serious. And uh, we talked about Atlanta a lot in the old days. And, and then it came down to, it. he said, you know, is there anything you want to say to me or ask me? And I said, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, when I told uh, my mother that I was working in politics, you know, I tell her who I was working for. And she, she said, I've never heard of them. But then when I told my mother that I was interviewing for a job with you, she got very excited. And she said, oh my gosh, he's a good one. And the congressman kind of paused and he did that thing where he kind of takes a silent moment and he takes a breath. And then he said, well, you call your mother back and you tell her you got the job. And that's where it all started. And, you know, I, I started that first year, I was answering his mail. And then he asked me to serve as his press secretary in his reelection campaign. And it was really on that campaign that we got to spend so much time together. And I got to know him so well um, that, that, well, he, he, he said it this way once he said, I became like a son to him. And um, I, I felt like he was a father to me. And it was, we had fun. I think that's the thing people forget. Like Anthony was saying, you know, he, he is the statesman. He is this uh, icon, but he was so much fun. He liked to play jokes on you when he would get a little restless in the office and he wanted something to go to happen and he wanted something to change or he wanted you to pay attention to him. He would come into the back and he would pick up a handful of the bag of peanuts and he would take that handful and he would throw it up in the air over the divider and it would just land on your desk. And you'd be like, Oh, Congressman's in the office. <laughs> and then you would go and he would, I would sit in the office with him and we would talk and we would have these long conversations, just watching the news. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, and, and that, that grew, I mean, into this relationship where, we talked every day and he would call me late at night and ask me, you know, I remember, I remember when Jamal Khashoggi was murdered and he called me at 11 o'clock that night and he was incensed and he, and he said, we've got to put out a tweet because I, I was the digital director. So I did all of his tweeting for, well, all, all of his time in Congress. And, 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 and it was that sort of trust that we were able to build where, you know, we were, we were, friends and we were collaborators it was i was just so lucky to get to know him in that way and it's just made this last year so incredibly difficult without him well then and you know that's one of the things i think about people who we think of as as icons and here at the the carter presidential library that's you know that's kind of how we think of president and mrs carter and we tend to not think of them as people, as, you know, as, as Anthony saw them first as aunt and uncle, and you see him as, you know, um, colleague, really. Um, we, we forget that they're people. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'll tell you a story. 
this is this is John Lewis had a sweet tooth. Okay, this was his vice. And when book one was just coming out, the very first book signing we did, where copies were sold after San Diego, was at the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. We were in Covington, Kentucky, and it was this amazing event. We we held we we, we locked arms. Uh, we sang "We Shall Overcome." He delivered this amazing speech. He let he made me speak, which I was really you know I had not been on stage before this. But then afterwards, we did this book signing, and there was this unbelievable line. It was like everybody from the event had come to to get a book, and we were shocked because we, we didn't know how people were going to react to it. And at first, we thought people maybe buy one or two copies, but these ladies were going home with armfuls. And they started this little scrum. And, and, and finally, this, this librarian, who's an amazing woman from University of Louisville, Fanny Cox, she had to regulate. She's, you know, one per person. Everybody gets a copy. And the congressmen are watching this going on. And we've never seen anything like it, especially not over a book, much less a graphic novel, right? So we're feeling high. As, I mean, it was, it was an a emotional moment for us. So we go to wait for our flight after the, after the event was over. We're sitting at the airport having a lunch and i as a child uh my mother when i did well would let me have a cherry coke but a real cherry coke it was a coke with grenadine and so i order one of these because i'm feeling good here we worked on this book for five years it looks like it might work out you know this was this was a lot of sacrifice and everything and so i'm having my coke with grenadine when it and when it comes to the table the congressman looks over and he goes what is that and you know i'm explaining it to him and, and he's like, I, I have to have one of those. I, I would like one as well. And so, so, so we order one and he has, he, he gets that first sip and he's just, he looks up and he goes, oh, this is sinful. You know? <laughs> and so we're sitting there and then we get the, the review from the Boston Globe, which, you know, Congressman always had a connection to Boston because of Dr. King and because of the movement and the Kennedys. And, and it comes out and it's this glowing review and I'm reading it to him and he's, sipping his diet his uh, cherry coke as i'm reading this to him and he finishes it and, and and he's taught he's sort of taking in the review and he says i think i'm gonna need another one and so there we were just getting like punch drunk on sugar and grenadine and coca-cola in this library or in this this airport lounge restaurant and that to me is always john lewis and that to me is what's so unique and special about this process to us because it was it was as fun for him as as it as you could possibly imagine you know it was just there was just so many of these inside jokes you know and like these moments and so then it became every time we had something nate remembers this anytime we had something to celebrate that was how he celebrated he had his coke with grenadine Anthony, is that is that the uncle that you knew? I'm laughing because it's so it's so funny. So as we're talking about sweets and stuff, it was almost notorious whenever my aunt and uncle would come into Los Angeles. Uncle John had a thing about Tommy Burger. Love, love, love Tommy Burger. And he would just he would go, Oh, let's go get a Tommy Burger. Let's go get a Tommy Burger. And we would get a Tommy burger and we'll sit, I'm, I'm over here at the house right now. And he'll sit in the back with the biggest smile on his face. And he'll just go, oh, I just love these burgers. I just want to try to get them back into Atlanta. But this is before Tommy actually franchised out. Oh, he used to love those Tommy burgers. And there was these little uh, like hoghead cheese things. He would cut and eat these hoghead cheese things. Now, I love cooking. And I'm, I'm totally into experimenting. And he was just like, he's like, no, nephew, here, you got to try this. You got to try this. He would cut it and put it on crackers. And I'll look and I'll go, okay, okay. But again, the most out of sight thing in the world, when, you know, we, when I'm hearing the, the, the Coke story, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm like, that's so spot on. And my aunt would just look sometimes and, and she'll say, now, John, Really, you don't need to be drinking all this. <laughs> oh, oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, Nate. Nate, I'm curious. I mentioned early on um, that 
you've got there's an interesting story about how you came on board to this uh, to this project for the for the March project. How did that happen? Uh, well, I had actually heard of March along the way. Uh, so I guess this would have been in 2010 at some point. I've been working with our publisher Top Shelf for at least five years at that point, and I was simultaneously finishing work on two separate graphic novels. Uh, I had my work cut out for me, but on my lunch break, I was checking, checking the news, and I saw a press release from Top Shelf for this book, March, uh, and read all about it. I saw this picture of Congressman Lewis, Andrew, and our publisher, Chris Staros. I was like, oh, what a great idea for a graphic memoir or graphic novel. That's, that's amazing. I simply didn't put two and two together that the absence of an artist mentioned in the press release meant there was no artist yet. So I was like, well, back to work. Got to finish these other books. Uh, thankfully, and it sort of receded from my mind for a week or so. Thankfully, my publisher, Chris Staros, gave me a call out of the blue making sure that I read the press release. I was like, oh yeah, congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, and he was like, well, I wanna reach out to you because this is really up to Congressman Lewis and Andrew, but I, I strongly suggest that, that you try out for the role of artist. Uh, and a lot of it simply had to do with some like practical visual aspects, the ability to balance representational and realistic cartooning with more expressive, um, intuitive cartooning, uh, but also being a Southerner and having a certain level of familiarity with not only the topography, the history, the culture, different things that would kind of, you know, connect the dots and supplies connective tissue within the narrative itself. Um, and also, I always make my deadlines. So uh, he just got me in touch with Andrew and uh, Andrew sent me some sample pages of script and I, I drew those pages. I got some notes back from the Congressman and Andrew. I redrew them. Uh, but really after about two weeks, uh, we all clicked very well. And we just decided to move forward full steam ahead and never looked back. It was, it was that quick and that seamless. Andrew, how do you, how do you go about putting together a book and you don't even have the, the Ill, you're doing a graphic novel and you don't even have the illustrator on board before you, you get the, the script done. I mean, I think a lot of it is faith. I grew up as a comic book fan. I mean, I was reading comics when I was eight years old. My first comic was Uncanny X-Men 317. It had the lenticular cover, you know. So, um, my grandmother bought it for me at a Piggly Wiggly in Western North Carolina. And so I've been reading comics my whole life, but I really didn't understand how to do a script. And I remember we proposed it and, and keep in mind, you know, most publishers said no for almost two years, we got rejected all throughout publishing. They didn't understand the project. Um, and finally uh, I got, I went to a, a, a independent comics expo in New York and I, I had pitched our publisher over the table. Like it was one of those like fantasy stories from, from, from nerd heaven where I was like, I have this idea. And he, he got it. And he said, but I've never seen you write anything before. So I need you to go home and spend some time, put together a script and come back to me and we'll see if, if it's something worth publishing. So I, I went back home. I'll never forget going back to my friend's apartment that night. And I'd been interviewing the congressman for months trying to prepare for this and just put things down on paper. And he made me sit down. When I got back to the apartment, I was all like, we got to celebrate. He was like, no, son, you got to write. And so he made me sit down that night and, and I started writing and I just started doing it. And Nate will be the first person to tell you I had no idea what I was doing. But I started reading other people's scripts. I started reading these, these uh, conversations you could find online, different writers, they, they would write essays about their writing process. And there is no real format per se for writing comics. You can do it in all sorts of different ways, but it's still fundamentally a script. And so I just started with that. You outline panel one, panel two, put in your panel description, write out the text, but you have to visualize it in your mind. And I think um, I definitely learned a lot after that first script, seeing how Nate laid it out and the way he paced things. Um, that was that was a masterclass in how you how you write comics. Uh, and, and, and I feel very fortunate to have gotten to do that uh, for, for the first book. But I think um, when it really comes down to it, 
your first goal, your only goal is to tell John Lewis's story as accurately as possible. And I think that's what we did a little bit differently than a lot of folks had done previously with books like this, is that we used actual sources, actual quotes, and John Lewis's voice to a T. I think there's always this instinct that people have to change the way he spoke. But he talked like someone who grew up in Alabama in the 40s. And there's no need to change that voice. In fact, it's wrong to change that voice. And I think you can really tell a difference when someone's heavily edited what he said or when someone's really changed the way he spoke to make it seem you know, more uh, palatable to the average reader. And I think that to me was the most important thing. And Nate actually could tell you the story when he tried out, he edited one line out and the Congressman was like, that's not how I say it. And we had to go back and we had to change it because first and foremost, the narrative of this is John Lewis and it is his voice. The rest is up to us piecing together the details, putting together the, the actual story as it plays out live, if you will, in the the narrative itself but why did why did he want a, a graphic a comic because he had just finished he had written a memoir before a traditional memoir yeah well that 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 starts with uh, that campaign in 2008 the congressman and i um we were having all these meetings about how do you reach young people right it was 2008 the congressman really got roughed up with a primary and and all the, the, the pressure and, and, and I don't know what you want to call it, but it was a difficult period for him after he endorsed Secretary Clinton and then switched to endorsing President Obama. And the main question of that campaign that people kept asking was like, at least internally, was how do we tell John Lewis's story? How do we make sure that young people understand the breadth and depth of his contributions to the movement and what he's done as an uh, icon of the civil rights movement? And so it was actually coming down to the end of the campaign when everybody was talking about what they were going to do afterwards. And some folks said they were going to go to the beach. Some folks said they were going to go see their parents. And I said I was going to a comic book convention. I was going to Dragon Con. And everybody laughed at me, you know, like, oh, look at the comic book nerd. I mean, this is pre-Iron Man. This is pre-everything, right? And the congressman didn't. He said, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the movement and it was deeply influential. And that was the first time I heard about Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story. And he recalled that, it, that he had read it when he was uh, a young man in the early days of the movement that had been influential to other people. So I went home that night, I looked it up, I read it. And then uh, I was just shocked because it's beautiful. 16 pages, cover to cover, studio house style from the 1950s, introduction to Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, civil disobedience, all of it. And it was so well done. I remember sitting there thinking, well, why isn't there a John Lewis graphic novel? I mean, he was a part of every chapter after this, whether it's the sit-in movement, the Freedom Rise, the March on Washington, Freedom Summer, Selma, Lowndes County, all of these important moments. So I went back to the meeting the next day when we had another one of these, and they kind of suggested all the same things. You know, maybe you could write another memoir. Maybe they could do a documentary. And I remember raising my hand and saying, no, what, what, what if the congressman wrote a comic book? And again, there was this like silence, this like awkward chuckle. And the congressman was so sweet about it. He said, oh, well, maybe. But then we kept asking. And I kept asking, you know what that means in politics, right? And I kept asking because I just became convinced that this would reach uh, far more people than, than anything else we were talking about, that this was worthwhile. And then with the historic pedigree of how Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story had worked to inspire some of the earliest acts of civil disobedience of the movement, it seemed almost self-evident to me. And I just frankly wouldn't give it up until finally one day he said, okay, I'll do it, but only if you write it with me. And that's where it all started. Yeah. Fury, you came on after the, the March trilogy was already a success. That has to be a challenge as well, coming new to the, the group. What was it like? Um, definitely a lot of imposter syndrome to, to fight internally. Um, first off following Nate as an illustrator, he's so accomplished and his art is so beautiful. Um, and my, my experience in comics was, was still fairly limited. I, I was basically learning on the job and what a intimidating job to learn on, you know, the stakes felt so high, but it was also... It was also such a blessing and it, it was just so exciting to get that email saying, hey, we've seen your work. Have you heard of March? Well, I think I, they, they mentioned March on the phone. 
Um, but yeah, it was it was surreal just having my pages shown to John Lewis and having John Lewis say, let's try her out. Like, I like her art. And that was just strange, very surreal. Nate, why, why bring on another illustrator? Well, uh, importantly, when we're talking about March being a trilogy, um, it, it's really, a, it's impossible to overstate how much the scope and scale of creating, publishing, and then promoting, touring, speaking, and acting in accordance with March became. Um, sometimes like just research and backup research became its own part-time job. But as each volume came out, um, the act of touring and promoting for each book was basically a full-time job. Uh, at the same time, we knew when each book was going to be published years in advance. We, we were highly organized in order to make this happen uh, to the very best of our abilities. Uh, I was also a new dad, and so things were moving along in the family tip. Uh, but over the course of that four and a half, five years of drawing the March trilogy, I had also gotten backed up with two other graphic novels. Uh, and I'd signed contracts. I had done as much work as I could, but their time was due. I, I was kind of painted into a corner. Um, so, uh, you know, like I, I feel a certain sense of responsibility and obligation to shepherd and safeguard uh, Congressman Lewis's work that we have produced together. And so there was no way I was going to not be involved with any future work. And we had, we had previously discussed what became run. Uh, as we were working on March Book Three, trying to figure out what its uh, what its final form would be, uh, and ultimately, I had to just listen to the voice of reason uh, and recognize that I did not have enough hours in the day to get it done. So we figured out creative solutions uh, to uh, allow me to be involved as much as I could, but also allowed the you know my my stepping away from the interior pages after the first 10 pages, we allowed that to have meaning within the structure of the book. So that the transition to Fury as artist was also meaningful. So my chapter at the beginning takes place just two days after the signing of the Voting Rights Act at the end of March book three, um, not only tying it uh, in, in proximity to the March trilogy, but importantly that John Lewis at age 25 is going from the US Capitol, getting on a plane or in a car and heading down to America's Georgia to protest with 12 or 13 other people at a random segregated church, doing the work, putting in the time, even after being in the hallowed halls of uh, the United States government just two days prior. We thought that was significant. And so symbolically, it was a good way for me to draw that chapter as a bridge and then be able to pass the torch. Well, now, Fury, then do you have to, as an artist, go back to the March trilogy and look and see, well, now, how did Nate draw this person and that person and to try and be consistent? There was a little bit of studying Nate's style, um, mostly his composition of pages and how he balanced um, dark and light values. But as far as drawing the people went, I kind of I tried to just lean into my own style there, so as not to complicate it too much, because you're already balancing your own style with trying to draw the likeness of a real person have them be recognizable, but also um, create create like a visual language for how you're gonna draw them from angles that you don't have photo references for. Um, so it's just, it was, it was a delicate balance of trying to smooth that transition from Nate's art to mine, but also trying to let my own style shine through. Well then, Okay, for, for both Fury and, and Nate, you know, it's one thing if you're illustrating a book of fictional characters, but it's a whole nother thing if these are actual people that 
look a certain way, um, dress a certain way. Um, isn't that hard? How do you do that? Yes. For me, <laughs> yeah, it's it's tricky. And, and I, I agree with Fury's approach. Like in a nutshell, my initial fear starting the process of drawing March was that I knew immediately what would turn March into a dry nonfiction comic. I knew what that would look like in my head and I knew that that's what I was trying to avoid. Uh, as I was trying to you know, draw and develop likenesses for these historical figures, uh, I found that what worked best was to work from photo reference until I had kind of developed a comfortable visual shorthand of my own for that person. Uh, and you can kind of see it in real time. Like over the course of March book one, I slowly develop my version of young John Lewis, the character. Uh, and once I, once I fall into that and it kind of crystallizes, I actually, I generally tried to avoid using photo reference except for these trickier moments that, that Fury mentioned. Uh, there were some folks where I, I really had to stick with photo reference as much as I could. Hosea Williams in particular, I found to be really challenging uh, to, uh, to draw free from reference. Uh, thankfully, he had a lot of documentation by 64 and 65. Um, but yeah, for me, it was a balance between knowing at which point to stop leaning on photo reference and allow the cartooning to do its work to actually mm -hmm. remain consistent and alive. And the where, where cartooning really shines is that you're able to get um, you're able to get expressions to to really communicate, you know, the emotion. Whereas when you're trying to stick, when you're trying to be too um, accurate to a photo reference, it risks looking a little bit wooden. Or you can sometimes, if you push it too far, you can lose the emotion. And I think that was ultimately the most important thing to accurately portray. But then that makes me think. It, it's tricky. You, you have to, you don't want to create caricatures um, where it would be very easy to make um, good and evil um, very distinct in the mm -hmm. way you do facial expressions or the way you depict someone who is, um, there's some, some shots of, of folks in the clan, and it would be very easy as, a, as an illustrator to depict them one way and the heroes, if you will, another way. How do you avoid that? I think just remembering that they're real people, um, and there, there is this instinct as a storyteller, especially if you've only worked on fiction, to, to push the narrative and make the evil people seem more evil and, you know, and the good people seem more good and to push these um, emotional moments. But it, I think it came through in the Congressman and Andrew's writing as well, just this, um, uh, you know, the, the gray areas, I guess, it, that it, it, you know, there's, I'm having trouble finding words. A big, a big part of the story is the split of, of SNCC, the split of the movement. And that was a particularly delicate subject to address because, you know, there's the emotional arc of the story for John Lewis is that he feels betrayed by his friends but through the writing he was also acknowledging where their disillusionment came from and um you know had this been a fiction it might have been tempting to push that emotional arc and make it seem more exaggerated but you know you had to understand where these people were coming from and you know when you're drawing them on the page treat them like the multi-dimensional human beings you know they're not the stormtroopers in star wars they have they have backstory they have real backstories because they're real people and just remembering that they're real people 
it's also important to note that, I mean, comics is just chock full of symbols. Like the visual language of comics is what allows us to convey a lot of subtlety without, without actually putting a word on the page. And so for a lot of these moments in order to cast, uh, for example, to, ca to cast villainy upon a character without falling into these stereotypes, uh, like a one thing I've always loved to do is by obscuring uh, a reader's eye contact with the person. So you'll see, especially with like Bull Connor, uh, you'll see a lot of harsh reflections on his bifocals, which prevent us from seeing the pupils of his eyes. Uh, and uh, it sort of gains enough distance uh, that it, it sort of produces tension in the reader. Uh, there are just, a, yeah, the, a lot of the visual language of cartooning is, is made precisely to kind of skirt around these problems so that we're actually avoiding being too cartoonish, ironically, by using the strengths of, of the medium. Well, you know, that's one thing, and I, I don't know if you can see it, but even the the balloons where the, the captions are, um, there are differences in the way the captions are, or the the words are not only the font, um, but the the round, you know, balloon, if you will. I mean, there are so many different ways that you present this to give impressions of anger or um, feeling. You give you give feeling in in the way that even that is drawn. Uh, certainly, I, lettering is really the glue that holds comics together uh, as a medium, as a storytelling medium. Um, but I think that uh, one of the most common ways people misread comics in terms of comics literacy is by still seeing this dichotomy between words and images. And so when people are, not only do people discount a lot of the nonverbal information that is in the images. Uh, they might be absorbing it as they read and as they look, but they're not processing it consciously as, as information uh, that, is, that is just as much a part of the story as the text. Uh, but also, yeah, the, vari the, the variations in the ways the words are delivered on the page makes a huge difference. That's where you get nuance and subtlety and tone. Uh, and I guess going back to villainy one more time, it's important to note that um, when we're talking about white supremacy, like casual white supremacy in day-to-day -day Jim Crow, Alabama and Tennessee and Mississippi, uh, it's important to note that, you know, the, the people, the, the white people in their daily lives who are resisting being bothered by, by their neighbors' rights uh, are generally uh, not starting at 100 with their resistance to, uh, to anti-racism uh, and to these people's movements. A lot of, a lot of the pushback at first uh, needed to be conveyed subtly, politely, calmly. And it was important as we moved through all of these books to show that relatively moderate gains in civil and legal protection were met by this disproportionate blowback in violence and in legislation. And so to go from March book one with these early sit-in uh, moments in downtown Nashville, uh, there's about a 10 page sequence that's building up to the first formal sit in that shows the breakdown of manners. Uh, but it shows that the tipping of power uh, from behind the counter at the at these lunch counters and how it is politeness. It is it is society's rules and expectations that are upholding white supremacy in this moment. And so getting to subtly watch these cracks form and watch the resistance to those cracks, uh, that that was a lot of the story early on. It's all subtlety. Yeah, do you you talk about? I mean, there are so many factors. Not only the 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 way the text is written, but even the 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 size of the panels and the placement of the panels, large panels for 
big events, uh, other other panels. How do you, as an illustrator, how do you guys do that? How do you decide um, this really needs to stand out? This is a big panel thing, or something is a a small. It's a they're meeting around a desk. Maybe that's a small panel. How do you decide that? And go for it, Fury. Yeah, you just try to think of the pacing of how you want the reader to to take it in. And if there is a quote that you really want them to kind of digest, that's when you save like maybe a two panel spread or just like that's the big focal point of the page. Um, and often it was in the, often it would be in the script. It would be thought of ahead of time. Um, and sometimes in scripts, they'll specify, I want this to be, you know, taken up half the page. But it's really, it's it's picking out the emotional moment that you want to highlight. Um, yeah. Is, is there a reason to do it in black and white? That had about three purposes. Uh, number one, for anybody born after the 1960s, our, most importantly, our way of relating to the historical memory of, of so much, but in particular, the, the history of the civil rights movement is through black and white photography and video footage. Uh, and so a lot of that was immediately, I hearkened back to being a kid in the eighties in Alabama and you know getting stories from my parents to fill me in on basic history, but also like still having sharp memories of the footage and the photo and the photos that I saw as a child. Um, and so I didn't want to, I didn't want to throw that easy connection away. It seemed very obvious that that was a link that would really help people um, feel a sense of continuity. Um, also, uh, frankly, uh, doing a comic in color and like, I, I do everything physically. I'm not a very, like on paper, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a digitally inclined artist, uh, which I'm not proud of, but uh, painting a comic in full color would take about twice as long and it wouldn't really provide any benefit to the story in my opinion. Uh, and so a lot of that came down to the practicalities of staying on schedule, doing your best work and not getting kind of, you know, cluttered or knocked off track by unnecessary complexity. And I do want to add that it seems counterintuitive, but it is somehow more challenging to do things in black and white than in color, not from a time perspective, but you just don't have, uh, you don't, you don't have the luxury of color to help you highlight. I want the reader's eyes to go here and you have to do that just with value. And it was, that was one of the many challenges <laughs> that I faced, uh, following Nate Powell. <laughs> you know, Fury, that, that just makes me think about photography and uh, black and white films. And it is always, I think more, you, you focus more on the message and the images in black and white because you don't have color to carry it or distract from it, which is what I think you all benefit from in this. Yeah, that's one, of the things, one of the things that I found fascinating in this, uh, Andrew, is, is after you get through all the, the panels, and then you've got this whole section of biography, short biographies of the people of the civil rights movement. You've got notes on each section of the book. Uh, you show your sources. Uh, you have uh, descriptions from uh, Fury and, and Nate of the, the artwork. Why do that? It's something we'd wanted to do um, in the earlier volumes. Um, it just wasn't traditionally done really in independent comics. Um, and, and we were very fortunate. Our publisher, Abrams, gave us as much leeway. They added pages to the book. They said, go for it. Um, but I think it also comes down to the fact that this period of history is not as well studied 
as the years prior. And if we're going to lay these positions out, we need to come with, with receipts, essentially. We need to have notes. We need to explain where we're getting our quotes from so that people who read the book can, can reference it. Students, teachers, um, librarians, they, they can know where we got this information from and it can serve as a marker for people who, who do later works to understand what we found. Uh, one of the things we were very fortunate uh, to have in the, the creation of these is access to a number of primary sources uh, from the SNCC archives that were largely maintained by a gentleman named Bruce Hartford, who runs a website called crmvet.org. And we were able to reconstruct many of the scenes, for instance, the scene where they discuss SNCC's opposition to the Vietnam War that then leads to Julian's ouster. Um, and the statement that, that, that really kicks off the, the conflict with Julian and the Georgia General Assembly. And, you know, when you look at it, there's, there's a similar scene in, in, of these discussions in SNCC that we have in book three that, that Nate would tease us and say uh, it was the Council of Elrond uh, for the Lord of the Rings fans out there. Um, and and what, what, but how do you do that? Right. Like, how do you actually reconstruct a discussion that happened in the middle of like in the late evening at the end of a long conference. Um, well, we were fortunate enough to have the meeting minutes and we use those so that everyone's quote is actually what they said straight from the meeting minutes. And then we reference which meeting minutes they were, how you find them. And we put those in the back. And I think that's what really needs to be happening in nonfiction graphic novels. Now, these are scholarly works. And one of the things that I noticed from a lot of, from, from a few uh, scholars who read March was, whether they would say, well, John Lewis didn't include uh, his, his, his end notes, his citations at the end. And that was because we were focused on getting the graphic novels out. And we didn't necessarily think of that early on, that, that would, we would reach that level where scholars would be looking at our work and saying, you know, oh, well, it's not hoity-toity enough, you know. And, and then we talked to librarians and we talked to teachers and they were like, oh, we'd love that. And for me, it was really a labor of love because, uh, you know, you dig into this, you spend months and years sifting through the documents, sifting through the reference material, other people's works, highlighting the other works that we felt were really good, like Hassan Jeffries, Bloody Lounds, and things like that. It was an opportunity for us to show um, all of the, the mechanics that were happening underneath the story and what really went into it and justify the, the scenes and how they were created uh, so that people could understand this is a truly nonfiction work. There's no editorializing. There's there's John Lewis's memories, and then there's the facts as we could find them. Yeah, I mean it's it's much like uh, in a, a traditional book where you have footnotes uh, that are that are included because it makes this really an educational uh, because you have people reading this that weren't born during during this time, and it gives them. Um, a way to to learn about the the participants and get more more information. Um, one quick note uh, for our viewers: uh, if you have any more, if you have any questions, when we've got a couple of them already in the Q and A box, go ahead and put them there. We're going to get to those in in just a second. Um, but it it really makes this uh, an educational tool about the. Uh, about the uh, uh, John Lewis and, and the civil rights movement, uh, much more so than just a, a graphic novel, something that you read and, and put down. Well, that was the goal, um, right? I mean, March one is- of the One of the questions, yeah, go ahead. It was just, that, was, that was the goal. One of the things, March is so widely taught we, we've gotten to have this incredible relationship with schools and, and as teachers and students. And, and that's what we wanted because this period of time is largely left out from the historical narrative. And if this book is going to fill that gap, we had to, to, to bring all of our resources to bear and reach that high standard. Yeah. Um, one of our viewers was asking the question, Andrew, what do you what do you think you talked about your excitement and your mother's uh, when you started working for for Congressman Lewis? Um, the viewer was asking, what do you think Congressman Lewis saw in you that inspired him to entrust his life's work to you? That's a heavy question. Um, 
you know, I think at the, at, at the root of our relationship was that we had very similar memories. We could both recall the dates and the places and who said what. And oftentimes we would find ourselves frustratingly trying to, to explain these details to other people and folks just didn't remember. And the Kaiserman once said to me that he, he said, there's nobody else on this planet who knows more about me than you do. And that just knocked me over. But I think it comes from the fact that we are the same kind of nerd to put it in like today's vernacular. I mean, people would joke that John Lewis was the one you always should ask about what happened because he had the best memory because he's the one who remembered. Julian Bond used to joke with the, about the Congressman. He said, if you want to know what plane that is flying through the sky right now, just ask John Lewis because he memorized the plane schedule and he knows which plane it is. You know, and that's what it is. We, we, we were able to communicate in a way that few other people could because we developed this, this like common language that we had. And, um, you know, I think it started small in, in small ways. He trusted me with his tweets and his Facebook posts and whatever else. And um, he would always call me when he couldn't remember something. That was another thing. It would be, I mean, any time of day. What was that boy's name? Oh, Congressman, that was so-and-so. And, you know, and I mean, Nate can remember us being at the San Diego Comic-Con at the booth signing stuff. And I get this phone call and he he's just, he, he wanted to remember something. And it was almost like for a while there, we had a shared brain. And I'm, it took years to build. And I think um, early on, he just, if anything, just admired me for being persistent. You know, I, I, I grew up poor. I grew up in the South. Um, my father was a Turkish Muslim immigrant. And I think he always rooted for the underdog. And so many times in our relationship, especially as we dealt with other people around him and in the, the world at large, I was the underdog. Our idea was the underdog. And John Lewis loved the underdog. And I think that's where it started. Mm -hmm. Anthony, what what did the the family think about John Lewis's life being told this way? I, I think um, when, when you look at our spa, our, we have there's there's two sections of of the family. You have the Lewis side, which is very the Lewis side is a very large family, and then from Lillian's side of the family, we're we're a real we're kind of a small group of folks there. But in general, in whole, when I when I think about both Lewis and Dixon, we, I mean we're excited. I was so excited when March came out. I was very excited about run um it, it's it's me as just as a person who's involved in politics not like how my uncle is but the guy behind the scenes but more importantly i'm we're watching history replay itself right now with a lot of different things that are happening in congress and stuff where we're, we're, we're playing it but i think as a family member it's always it's just it's always a proud moment. It was a real proud moment when I walked to Costco today and and I saw and I saw this sitting on the counter, and not only was this on in Costco, but when I turn to this page here, that really this it, it just takes me it just it takes me back and makes me feel so good, and I met I met Andrew through the telephone through my brother, and. You know, there there will be times that we'll just talk, and I learn more about the aspect of working and being around the office from Andrew because we would just talk about different things. But to answer your question, I think every last one of us from both sides of the family, and I became friends with a lot of the Lewises, yeah. and it's you know, I think every one of us are just proud. It's just a really proud. It's a proud time, proud moment for all of us. Yeah. yeah, one of one of our viewers was was writing about really the the timeliness of uh, of Run Book One um, and points out that early on uh, in the the text uh, it notes that um, 
despite the passage of the Voting Rights Act, um, there was a structure, power structure that was uh, making it possible to prevent Black Americans from from voting. And they said that they were reading the the comic uh, earlier and saw this was at a time when in Georgia um, there was legislation uh, to restrict voting. And they, they said, you know, it just, it seems like history is repeating itself and said that, you know, maybe this, the, the timing of this is simply a, a reminder of, of what can, can happen. Um, it makes it uh, very timely today. You think so? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, um, it makes you kind of reaffirm in all of the work that was done, all of the work that was put in, all of the beatings, the pushings, the stabbing, I mean, the, the beatings, the pushings, just everything for, you know, so we can restrict voting, so we can say, well, we're gonna make it a little harder for you to vote. Um, I, have, I have two kids and two grandkids and it's for, for my kids growing up, it's imperative that they vote. My uh, my grandbabies are reading March right now. They're babies, but they're they're reading it, and they're they're gonna read this also because they need to know. They 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 need to know the story also. So it's 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 taking it back in the time, but like they always say, um, history. This is something that we've seen before. We're seeing it now, and. Hopefully we would have to see it again, but it's it's right in it's in our face right now. Yeah. You know, if if I could chime in on this, I think it's amazing to me that we're seeing in places like Georgia and places like the state of Texas, uh, Nate calls them memory laws. We're seeing them try and systematically exclude the teaching of this period and the the lessons frankly, that John Lewis is trying to teach uh, teach everyone through these graphic novels. They're trying to exclude them from the classroom at the same time as they're trying to use the same tactics created during Jim Crow now against us. And I think that's what makes Run so important to show how they, they, they use tactics like moving polling places or packing precincts so that the lines ran too long or banning comfort items. I mean, these are, this is the exact same playbook we're seeing rolled out across the country right this moment. And it, I don't think John Lewis ever imagined that in telling those stories that he would be, that, that it would come at a time where we were confronting such direct and obvious derivations from those tactics. But that's, that's the nature of this beast because Congressman would say, with the graphic novels that the spirit of history was with us, that we had an important mission to tell these stories. And that's why we have to keep going. That's why we're out here talking. That's why we're bringing these graphic novels to everyone. And that's why we had to finish. Because if we let those lessons escape us, if we forget that that's what happened and that's how, that, how it happened, and that it was immediate, that we're fighting the same struggle that John Lewis fought in 1966 with many of the same actors and, and, and characters, it's, then we're, we're just doomed and we have to learn it. And I believe that the only thing at this point that will save us is the young people reading these, these stories and understanding their power and stepping up. Because I think you look at student loan debt and you look at this voter suppression and they go hand in hand, the memory laws. If, if you can't teach young people about their power and then you burden them with student loan debt so that they can't be like John Lewis was and graduate from college and take a $10 a week salary to be chairman of SNCC, to be an activist, then you'll never have a generation exert so much influence over our society. Because it's, it's a, you have to keep in mind how fundamental the shift was because of the laws that SNCC and CORE and SCLC were able to get through the Congress and LBJ. If we didn't have the Civil Rights Act, if we didn't have the Voting Rights Act, where would we be now? But they came about because young people found their power, found their voice, and were able to force them to do it. And if we were able to have a generation that could do that again, then so many of these problems and these challenges that we're staring down the barrel of right now could be addressed. But that's why we see student loan debt being piled on these young people. That's the unspoken portion of this book 
that John Lewis could never have been John Lewis had he graduated from American Baptist Theological Seminary and had to go take a corporate job to pay back his loans. Andrew, do you worry that with the, the moves for education that things that are presented in this book wouldn't be able to be taught in schools? Absolutely. I think this is in direct response in many ways to how successful March has been at changing curriculums. March is now one of the most widely taught graphic novels in America. It brought the civil rights movement back into classrooms. When we first started this, there was something called the nine word problem. It was a term coined by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And it said this in effect, after they conducted a nationwide survey, that most students were graduating from high school only knowing nine words about the civil rights movement. But March changed that. And now they're fighting back. And that's what concerns me so much is that they are actually trying to address us head on and they're propping up straw men for their arguments. But what they're really about, what this is all coming down to is teaching young people how much power they had. It's not just about making white folks feel good because they don't want to hear that the Klan existed. This is about young people understanding that when they band together and they use nonviolent civil disobedience in an organized and effective way, they can fundamentally change our society and they don't want that change. Where do you all go from here? The title is Run Book One. Is there book two? Is there more now that we don't have John Lewis to, uh, to count on to, to lead this? You know, we finished a second script because this had originally been one giant book. We had a tendency to do that. Um, that's how March started out. It was one giant book. But I think right now we're just so relieved to have this book out into the world and we know it's such an important book to have out there that we really haven't taken the time to make any decisions i think the congressman had a way of saying uh he would have called it a quaker consensus and i think nate fury myself the congressman's family we all have to come to a, a quaker consensus on what we want to do next but right now i'm just so grateful that that nate and fury put in so much time and so much effort and sacrificed so much to be able to get this book done and out at a time when the world couldn't need it more. Absolutely. You can get a copy of uh, Run Book One from Acapella Books. Uh, it'll have a uh, signed book plate in it. They can also get you, if you haven't uh, gotten the, the March trilogy, Acapella can uh, get those for you as, as well. Andrew, Nate, Fury, Anthony, this has been fascinating. Um, I personally learned a lot uh, in in reading uh, Run Book One. Uh, it's just, uh, it is really good. Thank you all for joining us uh, tonight. This has been a, a fascinating, uh, fascinating evening. We really appreciate it. And to our viewers, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you all very much and have a good evening.